Commissioner, she were live. We're live. Uh -huh. We're back from our executive session, and our next item on our agenda is the enforcement action. Um, BDC case 12-160. This is a time set to hear dispositive motions in the rear to matter. PDC case number 12-160. The commission received Mr. Reardon's motion to demit, dismiss or in the alternative motion for summary judgment on March 10th. The motion consisted of 23 pages. Attached to the motion were exhibits R1, R2, R6, A, parts 1 through 3, R8, R9, R10, R10A, R11, R11A, R12, R12A and R13. Also attached was a CD with the interviews conducted by Mr. Lemp. The commission also received the staff's response to Mr. Reardon's motions. S staff's response consist, uh, consisted of 11 pages. Attached to the response were the report of investigation in the Reardon matter and 30 attached exhibits. Also attached to the response was the report of investigation in the Colton matter and 13 exhibits. Finally, the Commission also received Reardon's reply brief, which consisted of 16 pages and no exhibits. Council, did the parties file anything further? Mr. Johansson? Uh, no, I did not. Mr. Stanifer? No, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I should just... Um, have Mr. Johansson identify himself for the record. I'm sorry, I should have done that. He's There's no problem. Um, Jim Johansson representing the respondent in PD case number 12-160, Aaron Reardon. Thank you. Are the parties ready to proceed with argument? Yes, we are. And Mr. Stanifer? Yes, I'm ready. And for the record, Chad Stanifer, Assistant Attorney General representing Commission staff. Um, do we need to let Mr. Johansson know who is here um, as far as um, commissioner? Because we ha we do have a full commission, Mr. Johansson, as full as our commission gets. Um, right. We also have, okay. Di we also have Director um, Lopez. And do you want? Uh, I'm I'm Penny Allen. I am an assistant attorney general, and I am. Commission counsel to the commission. Okay. Um, so now I lost my place. The parties will have 10 minutes per side to present their argument. I'll keep time for you. Um, Mr. Johansson, you may proceed. All right. Again, for the record, my name is Jim Johansson. I represent the respondent in this matter, uh, Mr. Aaron Reardon. I'll start with the motion to dismiss uh, PDC's complaint 12-160. The PDC staff's notice of the administrative charge was filed on December 2nd, 2012. I'll refer to it as the complaint that's uh, marked as uh, Respondent Exhibit 1. It's statutorily defective. If you refer to Respondents Exhibit 1, I'm looking at, first of all, the Notice of Administrative Charges. And that consists of one, two, three, four, five pages signed by Evelyn Fielding Lopez dated December 2nd, 2015. If the Commission, you know, in, pardon? Can you hear me? Go ahead, Mr. Johansson, you're fine. Okay, so the commission uh, note of the opening statement under jurisdiction number number one, uh, they'll note that the commission staff cites RCW 42.17A RCW as a statute that has jurisdictions over this proceeding. And then, of course, it follows with the AP Act and some other administrative uh, procedure uh, titles. But the main jurisdiction here 
that they're pursuing under is RCW, Mr. Reardon, under is RCW 4217A RCW. Now that clearly is marked by the commission staff as footnoted down below, became effective on January 1st, 2012. In fact, the staff clearly notes in their own notice of the charges, administrative charges of the complaint, that the alleged use of facilities of a public office or agency applies on or after, keyword on or after January 1st, 2012. The alleged misconduct by Mr. Reardon alleged in the violations is occurred during his campaign and occurred in November of 2011. So any after acts alleged that Mr. Reardon committed occurred prior to the enactment of 4217A RCW. This is further confused by the fact that under allegations, the PDC states in the complaint under number two allegations, they cite Again, 4217A555, which was enacted January 1st of 2012 for any misconduct or alleged acts that occurred after that date. So now if you turn to the two-page enforcement hearing notice, also marked as our Exhibit 1 and attached to respondents' motion to dismiss, you'll note that the staff sites under authority at the top where it, where it notes the February 25th hearing, of course that's been continued, but the relevant portion I'm referring to here is the authority. They cite, again, the statutes that don't go into effect until January 1st of 2012. And specifically they cite RCW 4217A 105, 110, and 755. Now the 755 statute that's cited under authority is, is interesting because that is the penalty portion and that particular statute is not contained anywhere in the Notice of Administrative Charges. In fact, there's no site in the Notice of Administrative Charges or reference in the complaint to any type of punishment or statute that's required under the APA, APA Act, which I'll get to in a minute. So, there again, we have statutes that are cited as authority both in the complaint by the staff and their enforcement hearing notice that was served by Mr. Reardon that cites the wrong statutes that weren't in existence at the time of the alleged misconduct by Mr. Reardon in 2011. Furthermore, if you look at that first paragraph of the enfor enforcement hearing notice, you can see that the staff is somewhat confused because now they're citing the 2011 law. They're citing RCW 42.17.130 here, which is actually the correct law that this this proceeding should be proceeding under. It's, it's under the 2011 law that was an effect of the alleged misconduct. In fact, if you actually look at the 2011 law, it clearly states in the title of 42.17130, use of public office or agency facilities and campaigns, prohibition exceptions, it clearly states in the caption effective until January 1st of 2012. And the other statute that went into effect, 4217A, clearly states, as the staff properly noted, applies to all this conduct, alleged misconduct that occurred after January 1st of 2012. Now, I cited the Washington, or the U.S. West versus Utilities and Transportation Commission because it sets out what's required under APA for notice and what, what should be contained in, 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 in a complaint by the, uh, by a state agency to give proper notice to a respondent. I might just back up for a minute before I get there and point out that 
the, the commission can do its own research. Uh, I did not actually include this in the staff, but I did look to see if there was any type of um, application of 4217A to other cases that would have involved conduct back in 2011. And I might just add as a side note that I could find absolutely no case cases that the PDC Commission has ruled on or that uh, addressed uh, that applied retroactively 4217A to anything that occurred prior to January 1st of, of 2012. As a matter of fact, the, the staff in the response cites no authority or no cases uh, in support of their allegations that it is retroactive to 2011 uh, misconduct. So I just thought I'd add that. Now, the U.S. West Communications case versus Utilities, Washington State Utilities Transportation Commission, cited by responded in the motion, in their motion, addresses the requirements of RCW 34.05 Point four three four sub two, and the requirements. There's nine criteria. There are nine specific criteria that any notice must include in order to be proper notice under the APA. And I'm specifically honing in in my motion on two particular subsections of two, and that's two F and two G. Both are missing. Both of those uh, qualifications or satisf satisfaction of those subsections are missing in the PDC staff complaint and notice of hearing. And that's specifically um, reference to these particular sections in the sense that they're required to adequately give notice to the defendant of the statutory provisions. And I'm looking now specifically at RCW 3405434, which states under sub or under two subsection F, the notice shall include a statement of the legal authority and jurisdiction under which the hearing is to be held. Well, here again, we have the wrong authority cited for the legal authority and jurisdiction. We have a 2012 law that's being cited to 2011 alleged misconduct. And then under G, sub G, a reference to the particular sections of the statutes and rules involved. Again, the notice cites wrong statutes and does not cite any penalty statute authority. And what the, what the PDC staff should have cited as they attempted to do in their notice of the hearing was cite the 42.17.130 statute along with the punishment part of that law of that chapter, which is contained in 42.17.395, and that's uh, the violations. And in that, and in, in the 2011 law that was effective until January 1st of 2012 and applied to any alleged misconduct back in 2011. Uh, of which Mr. Reardon is, is alleged to have, have done. It clearly states under four that no individual penalty assessed by the commission may exceed $1,700 and in any case where multiple violations are involved in a single complaint or hearing the maximum aggregate penalty may not exceed $4,200. And that's the law that should have been cited. Nowhere, anywhere in the PDC staffs, either complaint or their notice of hearing, does that statute show up. In Could fact, you if you turn the page two. Time. Uh, could you please, yeah. wrap, please wrap up quickly? Okay. If, if, you, if you turn to page two, you'll see that the uh, up to page two of the notice of the enforcement hearing, you'll see that the staff actually cites uh, a provision from the, the 2012 law under 4217A where they say they have the authority to accept a $10,000 penalty, which this is not correct. The, the notice is defective, and I'm going to move to the next issue because I do have 
limited amount of time. Under the Lubman versus State Department of Health Division One Court of Appeals case, uh, that case clearly states that ex post facto prohibitions is applicable to administrative proceedings where penalties and punishment are increased after the commission of the act. And if you reference my exhibit attached to my motion for respondent under exhibit two, you're going to see a, uh, a memo from the PDC dated September 27th, written by Nancy Cryer, general counsel at that time, to the members of the Public Disclosure Commission. We were clearly grappling with the issue of how do they deal with this law change? Because it doesn't appear that nobody in the commission or the staff has direction in terms of how to deal with the change in the law. And clearly the staff is asking the commission for some direction here Mr. Johansson, I'll give you 30 seconds. I'm not going to go through it because I've got a limited amount of time, but I think... time, sir. 30 seconds. Will I get a chance to do a reply? There will be a reply. Will I have a chance to reply? Rebuttal after Mr. Stanford. Right. So, okay. So, the, the, uh, the commission can read my materials. My materials is pretty, pretty clear on the argument. I just want to highlight the major changes here. If this statute is is punishment, it, it is an increase in penalties. If you go through the PDC's own comparison chart in detail, you can see very clearly that the former RCW 4217 was greatly increased and changed in January 1st of 2012 when it amended it to 4217A, not only to increase the penalty amounts, but also to add uh, different sections of crimes, a misdemeanor, a gross misdemeanor, and a Class C felony. So it expanded uh, the ability for the commission to make referrals to, to local prosecutors to charge respondents with, with crimes. So clearly this is a punishment statute. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stanford. Thank you. 13 and a half minutes. Okay, I'll try not to take that time. Thank you. Um, the respondent's motion should be denied for three basic reasons. Number one, the respondent was properly notified of staff's alleged violations. Number two, the commission may levy a penalty of up to $10,000 in this case. And number three, the respondent has not carried his, his burden of proving that there are no disputed issues of material fact uh, such that summary judgment is appropriate. As to the first issue, notice, uh, there is really no confusion here. Mr. Reardon has been charged with violating former RCW 4217-130, the statutory provision that was in effect at the time of the alleged violations which occurred in 2011. Now the notice of charges does reference uh, 4217-855, a but there is, is an explanatory footnote disclosing the recodification of uh, former 4217-130. Now, Mr. Reardon argues in his <clears throat> reply brief, and he argued today, that we are trying to, staff are trying to retroactively apply 17A-555. Staff are not. Uh, as our brief made clear, there is, uh, there is no retroactive application here of that statutory provision. And it, it's important to point out, there's also no material difference between former 4217-130 and the current 4217-A555. And that's critical because Mr. Reardon is claiming he's been denied due process. Uh, he has not, because he can't show any prejudice as a result of the staff's notice of charges. Uh, this hearing is still several weeks away, and Mr. Reardon knows what statute he's been charged with violating and can adequately prepare his defense. Now, turning to the penalty issue, uh, there is a difference between retroactive application of 555, which is not being done here, and retroactive application of the Commission's penalty authority. And staff would submit that there is no uh, issue with retroactively applying your penalty authority. There's, first of all, no ex post facto violation uh, because under the State v. Ward case, uh, the ex post facto prohibition applies only to laws inflicting criminal punishment. 
Now, a respondent argues in his reply brief that ex post facto applies to both criminal and punitive um, measures, statutes, uh, and implies that the penalty provision is punitive in nature. Uh, but in fact, as State Reward makes clear, uh, the court stated there that a regulatory law is classified as punitive only when, quote, the actual effect of the statute is so punitive as to negate the legislature's regulatory intent, unquote. Now, the penalty authority uh, in the R in RCW 4217A is clearly a regulatory provision. There is a separate provision in 750 that authorizes the commission to refer matters for criminal prosecution. This is not a criminal proceeding. Uh, the Commission's authority to refer matters for prosecution in no way relates to its, to its own authority to levy a penalty, which is found in 395. Uh, the Commission does not have authority to prosecute Mr. Reardon criminally. Whether his conduct is a crime is not at issue in this proceeding. Rather, pursuant to the Commission's regulatory authority, the issue is whether Mr. Reardon can be ordered to pay a penalty uh, because the staff have established a violation by a preponderance of the evidence. It's important to point out too that there is case law which talks about uh, that generally statutes need to be applied prospectively, but statutes may be applied retroactively if they are remedial in nature and retroactive application would further that remedial purpose. As we pointed out in our response brief, Remedial statutes uh, generally afford a remedy or better or forward remedies already existing. In amending the uh, Commission's penalty authority, the Commission, or excuse me, the legislature bettered a remedy available to the Commission by increasing that penalty authority to $10,000. Quickly, the, the staff would also point you to a case not in our response brief. In State v. Ralph Williams Northwest Chrysler Plymouth Corporation, which is found at 82 Washington 2nd, 265, the Supreme Court was analyzing the penalty provisions in the Consumer Protection Act. It stated that, quote, the existence of penalties in an act do not make the act quasi-criminal in nature, unquote. And the court also stated that, 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 quote, the legislature has wide discretion in the choice of remedies to promote compliance with the law, and providing for fines in a civil proceeding does not convert the proceeding to a criminal or penal one, unquote. Similar to the Consumer Protection Act, which protects the public from unfair or deceptive trade practices, 4217A was enacted to protect the public from certain abuses in the arena of political campaigns. The legislature determined the commission should have penalty authority, and that authority promotes compliance with 4217A and does not convert this proceeding into a criminal one. Staff would also submit that even if the commission were to determine today that their penalty authority is capped at $4,200 in this case, that is not a basis to dismiss this case. Rather, the respondent may be apprised of the commission's intent to levy a penalty of no more than $4,200 in the event a violation is found. Having been so apprised well in advance of the hearing, Mr. Reardon will be able to adequately prepare for the hearing and will certainly have suffered, suffered no prejudice that would warrant a dismissal. And then finally, I'll turn to Mr. Reardon's argument for summary judgment. That must be denied because there are clearly disputed issues of material fact between the parties. The parties have vastly different views of Aaron Reardon's extensive use of his county cell phone for campaign purposes, as well as his use of his office to meet with political consultant Colby Underwood in furtherance of his 2011 re-election campaign. There are facts in dispute about Mr. Reardon's hiring of Kevin Holton, who, who spent a significant amount of time in furtherance of that same campaign. The documentation establishes, and is, and is not in dispute, that Mr. Reardon uh, spent over 3,000 minutes on his county-issued cell phone and sent or received over 1,000 text messages to paid campaign consultants. He does not dispute that. He only disputes that he, he claims that none of these communications, zero, 
related to his campaign. PDC staff contend otherwise, and that is precisely why a hearing is needed in this case. Uh, similarly, he contends none of the 56 meetings that were held in his office in 2011 with Colby Underwood related to his 2011 campaign. Again, staff contend otherwise. That is why a hearing is needed. Uh, and then finally, staff allege that Kevin Holton did engage in extensive opposition research against Mike Hope, Mr. Reardon's 2011 uh, re-election opponent uh, on county time using county resources. Mr. Reardon disagrees, but again, that is why a hearing is needed. Mr. Reardon has simply not carried his burden of showing you that there are no disputed <coughs> issues of material fact. This matter should proceed to hearing. With that, I, with that, I am probably close to being out of time, and I would certainly uh, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Johansson, you've exceeded your time, but I'll give you two minutes to rebut. Okay, well, just real quickly, the, the commission needs to read NRA FD Processing Inc., which clearly is, I think, the controlling case in this case, where it, the, the legislature has to specifically intend that the statute be applied retroactively. Here in 4217A, they didn't put any language in there to make it retroactive. So for the staff to create its own legislation and, and try to go over the top of the legislature and, and say that it's retroactive just because they say it's so, it doesn't make it so. And clearly there's uh, three, um, three, three issues that are followed to talk about it is the retroactive application is curative or remedial, remedial and they define that here, clearly, it's not remedial, and it's not curative per the case. It's, it's, it's designed to increase the punishment and add further punishment. And then it doesn't affect a, a retroactive application uh, enforcement effective vested right. Clearly, it affects Mr. Reardon's uh, property rights. And in fact, that it increases the penalty from potentially $4,200 to $10,000. Now, uh, the PUC staff argues that there's no prejudice in this career, and I would, I would assert otherwise. Whenever laws aren't followed by governmental agency staff, we are all prejudiced. Every one of us is prejudiced when, when agencies, governmental agencies, don't follow the laws and create their own laws, which is what the PDC staff is doing here. So beyond the fact that Mr. Reardon has had to hire a lawyer, spend more money to try to figure this mess out and bring it to the commission's attention, uh, it makes it impossible in good faith to try to negotiate a settlement, which is what the PDC commission puts an emphasis on. They say in all of their statutes that they encourage the parties to settle the dispute. Well, how can you settle the dispute when you don't know what the penalty is? Is it $4,200? Is it $10,000? What exactly, you know, it, where is the common ground? Where is the level playing field? Every time we try to do a settlement in this case, the PDC staff keeps moving the goalposts. There is no good faith settlement uh, that can be had in this case. It makes it impossible to settle this case when you don't have clear statutes that are given in the notice, that there's no clear direction on what the sides are basing the penalty on and the punishment on. So I would submit there is prejudice, a severe and extreme prejudice to my client and its ability to be able to resolve this case when they keep uh, moving the goalposts uh, up on him. And finally, on the summary judgment, I think you just have to listen to Mr. Lemp's in interview and look at the Washington State Patrol interviews. I'm not going to go through all that again, but I've spent a lot of time on that. And I, 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 I beg to differ with the staff's assertion that there's any facts that they assert that, that, that any evidence that shows that Mr. Reardon violated any campaign laws. It is just assumptions and uh, this wild assertions and, and contradictions by the staff investigators. 
that that it just doesn't bear out when you listen to the interviews. And you have to actually listen to those interviews and go through the exhibit site. I uh, included in my motion with the Washington State Patrol. This thing has been investigated for years, and they found no no crime. The Washington State Patrol found no crime against Mr. Reardon, and it's it's all well documented. And the, and the commission just needs to spend some time to listen to the interviews. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commission, have any questions for Mr. Johansson? Seen none. Oh, I'm sorry. None for Mr. Um, commission have any questions for Mr. Staniford? I, I do. Um, on the, uh, well, I guess the first question, do you, counsel for the respondent was saying that the FD processing case was dispositive on the issue of the application. You're going to have to eat the mic. So, so this is, can you hear me, uh, Mr. Johansson? Can you repeat the question one more time? I will try to get the question out for the first time on the microphone. Um, my question was for uh, Mr. Stanifer, and that was uh, whether he agreed or not with the state, with Mr. Johansson's statement that the FD processing case was dispositive on the question of retroactivity. And, and I think the, the case is informative, and I, what I would say, and I'm glad you asked the question, is that what counsel stated is that that case stands for the proposition that you need a specific uh, proclamation, specific language in the statute saying that the law was meant to be applied retroactively. But when you read that case, it, it actually doesn't state that. What it states is that's one way to, to determine legislative intent but it goes on to state that uh, you can deem whether a, uh, a law is meant to be applied retroactively even if there's no specific language in the statute saying it should be applied retroactively. And you would agree there's no specific statement in the statute? Certainly, I okay. would agree with that. Any other questions from the commission? Seeing none, what is the commission's wish? Would you care to deliberate? So we will um, deliberate in private um, for five minutes, five to ten minutes. Hope we'll return here by 1.40. Okay, for Mr. Johansson, this is uh, Evelyn Lopez. The Four commissioners and legal counsel, uh, Penny Allen, are going to leave the hearing room. <laughs>